business owners likely will have only one shot to sell a business. Most don't understand what drives value and how buyers look at a business. Until now. Welcome to the How to Sell a Business podcast, where every week we talk to the subject matter experts, advisors, and those around the deal table about how to sell at maximum value. Every business will go to sell one day. It's only a matter of when. We're glad you're here. The podcast starts now. This week I had a first for me, which was to be on Twitter spaces. I'm not really certain exactly what Twitter spaces were, but I was on them. And I had the opportunity to to be joined or to be invited by Kevin Henderson and Eric Pasifici of the SMB Law Group. And those guys are setting the world on fire as far as doing great law work for small small and mid-sized business buyers. And so we started down this path of um, writing for their newsletter. So one of my brethren of the business brokerage industry, uh, Clint Fiore, out of um, Texas, he and I contributed to their M&A Masterclass uh, newsletter, and it was very well received. So we jumped on Twitter spaces and we we were joined by. I don't know. I think it, when, when I last saw the numbers, I think it was like a thousand of our closest friends. And we were talking about how buyers can work with brokers more effectively and, and how the mechanics of that all work. So I thought it would be really good. Even though this podcast is, is really geared towards sellers, it really would, might be helpful for business sellers to understand how brokers are working with the buyers that are candidates for their business. So at any rate, I hope that you enjoy my conversation or my participation rather with Clint Fiore, Eric Pasvici, and Kevin Henderson on Twitter Spaces. Well, welcome everybody to this live chat uh, for the M&A Masterclass, the Kevin Business Buying Masterclass that Kevin and I have been running for the last couple of weeks. Uh, this is the first live chat of this nature. We thought it would be fun to, you know, expand on the written portions of the master class. And this week we had a, you know, honestly, uh, a really fun uh, piece that was contributed largely by Ed and Clint with some commentary around the edges from, from Kevin and I. And I learned a lot uh, in reading it and had a lot of takeaways about the search process, uh, myself, because, you know, being involved in the elements of the business buying process that Kevin and I are on the legal front, you know, we don't see the very front end of the search very often like buyers do and really like brokers do. And as everybody on this call probably knows, brokers, you know, have a tendency to get a bad rap in the business buying world and in the business buying process, but they are arguably the most important part of your search as a buyer, particularly as a first time buyer, because, you know, as we'll cover this week, when we address proprietary searches or, you know, off market searches, you know, those are very difficult. And oftentimes Kevin and I and other people who have been around business buying and the, the search fund or search world will tell you, you know, Doing an off-market search in your first deal is probably not a good decision. Uh, they're very difficult to to find. They're very difficult to close. You don't have the broker there to grease the wheels. And so, enter Mr. Broker, and you guys play a really critical role in helping the buyer find a high-quality business. Because as we discussed, and as the current issue of the masterclass addressed, the vast majority of high-quality businesses are typically sold before they ever even hit the market. Most buyers don't even know that they uh, were for sale before they are sold. So um, having a high quality relationship with a broker, appreciating a broker and understanding their, their perspective and their role in the transaction is critical to buying a high quality business. So super fun to have Ed and Clint on the call and as a part of the masterclass. Tonight, um, I won't. Uh, I'll, I'll do fast introductions. Kevin, feel free to jump in if you have anything you want to say here at the outset. I'll do quick introductions of Ed and Clint. 
and then I'll let them introduce themselves. If there are any other brokers on the line or anybody else who wants to contribute tonight or feels like they have something to contribute to this portion of the the masterclass, please feel free to jump in. I see some incredible people on the line. Ray Drew, Lisa Forrest, um, Andrew Hoffman, a lot of incredible people on search are on this call. So feel free to jump in if you guys want to add something to the conversation. But uh, brief introductions, we've got Ed Mizoglan, and apologies if I got that wrong, Ed, but Ed is the founder of, or sorry, Ed, I'm, I'm butchering this already. You're the managing partner of Indiana Business Advisors, IBA, renowned business broker with over 30 years of experience. We also have Clint Fiore, founder and CEO of Texas-based Bison Business, which is now a national brokerage. Um, Clint and Ed are both very highly regarded and well-respected in the business buying SMB Twitter world. So appreciate having both of you guys on, on the call. And Clint, for those of the few people who don't know who you are, feel free to give a brief introduction. Yeah, so um, I am a business broker, live in Central Texas, and uh, CEO of Bison Business. We are consider ourselves kind of like a, a, a new school business brokerage that just does good deals for great people. And uh, yeah, we're just trying to raise the bar as much as we can on an industry that does suffer from a bad reputation. And uh, we want to be very educational, represent great deals, and do a good job at it and kind of prove that we're not all worthless losers. <laughs> no, but we we do uh, you know good work. I've got a great team around me. And, um, and yeah, it's just been a real fun, a fun year and a half kind of getting to know you, Eric, and, and getting involved with SMB Twitter and, uh, sharing as much knowledge and value as, as I can. But yeah, I've been doing this about eight years and, uh, just kind of obsessed with, you know, how do we make this easier? Cause it's just, it's tough. I've been a buyer. Um, I know how hard it is to find good deals to get brokers to call you back to get deals done is very difficult and i think that it's going to be a team effort from this whole industry people like smb law group and ed and other great brokerages out there are going to all be part of the solution of just let's all figure out how to do this better more efficiently and raise the bar so that we can get more more quality deals done for quality people uh clint looks like it's just me and you for right now man so let's let's not keep everybody waiting Tell us in your own words. I mean, obviously, I rambled on at the very beginning uh, about you know the importance of brokers and you know why, as a buyer, you should be nice to brokers and you should care about brokers. But tell us from your own pr- perspective the significance of brokers in the business buying transaction. Yeah, I think a lot of the a lot of the best deals are represented by brokers, and I think that that it's wise to uh, learn how to work with them. And I think that, you know, in general, a lot of the bad rap comes from we're just really busy. And, you know, Ed was sharing some stats. I hope he's able to get on and and speak. But he's very good at this stats side of this. And, uh, you know, from my own firm's experience, when we get a great deal, we often get contacted by 100 to 200 people that will sign the NDA and want to get the SIM. And it's, it's tough for us to even with the team working together to get back to all 200 people at the, at the speed and um, that they want to talk to us um, when we have a good deal coming to market. So, um, you know, I hope that, you know, you won't get just blanket discouraged when you didn't get that call back, but we're going to share some tips tonight on just ways that you can kind of position yourself to, to be quick, uh, to get the best results and to um, be able to snatch up, you know, the good deals that do come through brokerages as they as they pop up. Ed, feel free to unmute and introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, Ed Meisigland. I've been uh I've been doing this has been my only gig for thirty years. In fact, uh June sixth happened to be my thirty first year. So so I've been doing it I've been doing it a long time. Um we do lots of deals. Um you know predominantly our, our Main Street side works you know, predominantly here in Indiana, but we have a, you know, a little, little boutique M&A type work that we do nationwide. We're, you know, we're, we're rocking along. It's, it's a, it's a good place to be right now. And, you know, it's a lot of fun to see what's, um, you know, what is happening in the space. And I was, I was grateful for the opportunity to participate 
you know, um, participate in the master class and I'm looking forward to visiting tonight. So, so what can I, what can I do and what can I answer? Well, first of all, um, Ed, in, in your defense, Kevin is our de facto CTO at, at our law firm. He, in fact, he, most days he helps me turn my laptop on and he's, he's struggling to get at it here. So, uh, so don't, don't feel too bad about that. To be, to be very clear, Eric, I think I was not the one struggling, <laughs> but that's okay. Fair yeah, fair enough. Uh, let the record reflect it. Probably me. But anyways, Ed, feel free to answer the same question that Clint did, which is tell us why business brokers are essential to the business buying transaction. And obviously it feels like an obvious answer, but tell us from your perspective. No, I, I actually don't think it's uh, as obvious it, it, as it might seem. I was just I was talking with a, a PE group earlier today, and you know, it's it's important that you know the brokerage world is moving from, you know, when I first got into this, it was the broker was the conduit, you know, the toll booth to the buyers. Now buyers are just as they can find as many sellers as we can. We just happen to have more transaction, you know, transaction reps on getting it to the finish line. And so I think, you know, brokers are having, um, I think they're instrumental so long as they maintain the you know, that they have the chops in order to get it, you know, get it from point A to, to, to the finish line. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. And to, to follow along what, what you and Clint said earlier, um, you know, one of the things that was most fascinating to me in the issue that we put together with a lot of your information um, was just how many deals actually happen before deals go out to, you know, the, the listing websites, the biz buy sells, you know, th th things like that. And, and I, I find myself curious, you know, does that vary by broker and brokerage or, you know, how common prevalent is that? I'm curious if you guys like not to hold you to specific numbers, but, you know, how, how many deals on average are you kind of finding and placing with buyers um, directly through your own sort of priority networks of, um, you know, database of known buyers and, and, and things like that? Like, help us how help us understand how often this happens and what it takes for buyers to kind of be part of that process before things end up on biz by sell or, or, you know, buy and sell a business and are, and are seen by, you know, millions of eyeballs. Clint, do you, yeah. you, want, do you want to take it first? Sure. Uh, you know, I, I'd love to, to jump in on that one. Uh, for us, when we did our very first deal, I was working from my ping pong table and I had no uh, buyer list or anything like that. And so I was kind of at the mercy of biz by sell and these other platforms. And so, you know, my first first listing, I put it out there. And then as you as you go and you grow as a broker, every time you put a deal out there for sale, I consider that to be kind of like a magnet for my buyer list. And so still to this day, eight years later, every every listing we get does typically get to the market, but our insiders hear about it first. So we tell our email list and our Twitter followers and our social media, we kind of reward those folks we have established relationships with by an early sneak peek at the deals and kind of give them first mover advantage. And then we, um, then we roll out to the main marketplaces uh, uh, with a, like a, a couple week delay usually. And so we get a couple waves of interest. And so, um, but I look at it like, like I was saying, every every opportunity we put out there is a chance for another hundred or 200 new folks to be magnetized into our firm through these marketplaces. And when we field as many of those inquiries as we can, we try to get to know those buyers, try to get them in our CRM on our email list, uh, following us so that they can be kind of that part of the insiders group. And then over time, how that's changed is, you know, at first it was 100% of, of the buyers were, obviously coming from uh, the public marketplaces. But then over time, it was about, it's been going up to 50%. Now I'd say it's more like 70% of the buyers that, that close deals with us this year are going to be people that were already 
talking to us before that deal hit the market. They're, they're either on our, uh, what we used to call our VIP list or the probably a good deal email list or, um, or they're just people we're connected to on Twitter, Facebook, other places like that, that we are, are already talking to. And so just, just to be clear and to follow up on that before we, we bounce to bet, uh, Ed, because I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on this too, Ed, but, but Clint, just to follow that thread for a second, cause uh, it, it, if I heard you correctly, even deals that are, you know, eventually going to close with like the, the VIP list or whatever you want to call it, right? Um, they're still, they're still going to during the process end up on the public web websites generally. Uh, if, if I heard that correctly, how are you thinking about or parsing, um, those leads or like what's the purpose of putting it in the marketplace? Is it just to kind of make sure you're getting the right pool? Of buyers, and that just so happens that over time, as you've built out these these lists and databases, that happens to be on your VIP list. Or help us understand what the strategy is to still list everything on the marketplace, as if the majority of these businesses are are, are not actually going to sell through those. Yeah, eventually, I want to have every buyer on planet Earth in my own proprietary database, right? But right now, I don't. And so, how I get more is by putting stuff out there as as uh, magnets. To bring them in, and so I don't like putting stuff on BizBuy or uh, buy and sell business or other places that's already locked up under contract with a buyer. So the way I time it is, we bring it out to our insider list, and then with a pretty short fuse, usually a week or two, it's not enough time for this to be um, under contract yet or under LOI yet. That we'll yeah. bring it to the we'll bring it to the the major marketplaces, and then a lot of times within another week or two after that, we change the listing to say under contract when we get a signed LOI, and and so you've got to be quick. Like um, you have a big advantage being on the insider uh, list, yeah. and having a few you know a couple weeks head start versus people that see it pop up among the you know millions of other people uh, trolling these big websites, and so that was one of the big kind of things I. I put in, and I think Ed said the same thing um, on your newsletter was just, you know, get involved with the brokers you like that represent the geographies and industries that you like. Make sure that you are on their proprietary outreach uh, or, or that you're on their uh, deal notification list uh, so you can get that. I, I've been doing that since I started, but I've been teaching that to the IB, IBBA and other places. And I think that's becoming a trend is a lot of these brokers will do that one, two punch. They'll, they'll release it to their insiders first and then the public second. So you're a little bit behind the eight ball. If you see it on, uh, biz buy most of the time, but that doesn't mean, um, I think the misconception is if it's on biz buy, then it's, it's been passed over or it's junk or like, that's not true. Like they're, when we put them out there on biz buy, they're still available and they're good. It's just, yeah. so there's, there's still good stuff out there. Um, but you just, you want to get in on it as quickly as possible. Got it. Well, let, let's get to the heart. Well, and, and first of all, let's back up for a second for the, those of you who just joined us. Um, M&A Masterclass, we're talking this week about brokers and getting a broker's perspective. We've got Clint Fiore, Ed Mizogland, two you know, very well-known um, and experienced business brokers that are giving their perspective on this. And I, I think, guys, let's get to the heart of it. I had dinner recently with Clint with your number two there, Dusty Block. And one of the interesting things that Dusty was sharing with me was how important maintaining the trust with the seller is for a broker. And I walked away from that conversation with the revelation that almost all of the things that you guys say buyers do in the search really feed into how can you trust them so that 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 you can maintain the seller's trust in the process. At least that was the dots that I was connecting and sometimes I misconnect. So I'd love to hear your guys' perspective. Tell the buyers on this call and that are following the masterclass, how do buyers earn your trust in the process so that they can get those early stage deals, those high quality companies before they hit the market? And we can start with Ed since you you took the last one. Okay, so when when a buyer is coming coming to us, or or we're going to get the buyer, the the biggest thing is that there is some evidence, you know, that 
I don't say that you're deal worthy, but that that you have you you have the ability to execute on the deal that you have, you know, that you you have the investable capital you have. You have, you know, the background, you know, if it's an SBA deal, do you have the operational background? Do you have access to, to people that can run the business? Do you have all of the ingredients in order to execute on on the deal? That's, you know, that's the, the first thing. We're, and we're looking at it. And as we've accumulated buyers over time, we continue to, to add in, uh, to our CRM what we know about these particular buyers so we can go to them you know, first and, and, uh, and address them because we know them the best. So to earn the trust is, <clears throat> again, it's back to, can you and will you, you know, operate in a manner that a, you know, the seller, you have far many more reps at looking at businesses than the seller has selling businesses. So, so they're outgunned. They, they don't realize it, but until, until the seller you know, reaches we call the deal theater. Once we get into the into that situation, now you're now you're talking you're taking live fire and the and the and the buyer, how that buyer behaves toward that seller will really dictate how what our relationship is going forward. You know, and, and there needs to be some grace and and some understanding that, you know, you may not get audited financials and that's okay. You know, we, we have a deal right now that, you know, the buyer is insisting on a on a deal room, and we just got past the the NDA, and he wants to do due diligence, and it's just like you know it's overwhelming to the to the seller. But my point is that it now creates a, a level of mistrust with the with the seller as well as the broker. We don't want to put the put the client in in a in a position where where they they feel as though that they're they're at a disadvantage even though technically probably they are that the buyer has a lot of leverage in this equation just coming into into this environment is at least initially is is first and and as i said in in the newsletter you know you only you start earning the trust of the seller i mean we can do valuation work we can do all kinds of all kinds of pre-sale work to establish you know, domain expertise, but until we earn the trust when we start defending the person that we're taking to market, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. And and if I can push on that just a little more, Ed, um, it, you know, one of the things I see with a lot of searchers and buyers when they're going through the LOI phase is, you know, they don't necessarily have full and adequate access to, for example, equity capital, right? Mm -hmm. We'll close a lot of deals where buyers are going to inject 0 to 2% of the, the deal price in equity capital with the rest of the equity coming from you know a handful of, of other investors who aren't going to commit to a deal until right there's an LOI and a commitment letter from a lender, etc. So what exactly does that vetting process of a buyer look like when you say that you want to see that they're qualified, that they have access to the capital and things like that, when they're not necessarily going to be able to provide you a bank account and brokerage statement right. that shows a, a million dollars of, of, um, you know, securities or, or, or liquid cash to be able to complete a deal? Sure. So, so what we tend to do is number one, do who in the net, who who in the network do we know that knows you? All right. And who and chances are where you're getting your equity, we probably have a pretty good idea of those people too. And and in situations on the smaller side, it you know, we would say, look, if you have an investor or whoever's going to deploy the capital, bring them because their time's worth more than than them writing the check. And we know that. Now, as you get the 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 challenge that we bump into is when it's when it's hey I'll know the I, I I can get access to the deal when I find the right deal but at first I gotta I gotta spend the next three months pouring over this business that's that's where the that's where we bump into the challenge you know it's one thing to say look we haven't you know we have an indication of interest and you know we we have other financing sources that we're going to be that we're going to bring in and that's that's perfectly okay we just need to be in a position to explain that, you know, we either A, we're not going to take it off the market, 
you know, we'll, we'll go ahead and look at your indication of interest or we'll add it to the pile. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, we're, we're going to continue to, until we have some evidence that you have the ability to execute or the, your partners or your LPs or whoever is going to participate with you, we're going to have to, to take some, some ancillary steps to ensure that we're, that we're not tying up the business if you don't have the ability to execute on the deal. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm following. That's super helpful, Ed. Um, Clint, if, if you want to build on that, you know, g- give us some, give us some examples to building these relationships. Like what, what, what are the, uh, what are the most welcome and kind of appreciated approaches when buyers are reaching out to you during a search to start establishing that relationship? Is it offering to buy you lunch? Is it, uh, you know, um, get on a phone call? Uh, you know, how, how do you kind of balance your, the, the timing requirements with the ability to build these relationships and start building that funnel? Yeah. I mean, you're saying the keyword, this, this is relationships. This whole thing's relationships. Uh, I think a huge mistake that buyers make, especially rookies, is they're familiar with like real estate deals, which are are usually just, you know, you're looking at facts and figures. There's not a relationship needed with the seller of a piece of real estate. It's just the thing. And it's just who can put the biggest number the fastest on the piece of paper and and lock it up is going to win the deal, you know, kind of, kind of this adversarial, um, relationship where, where you don't trust the broker on the other side. You think they're just a salesperson and, um, you know, you you take everything they say with a grain of salt and there's some wisdom there, but with businesses, this is a living, breathing thing. It's, it's the seller's baby. They want to sell to someone they like, you need to like them and trust them. They need to like you and trust you with us. Um, we want to get, we want to get to know you and then we want to get you to, to meet the seller, usually either by a phone call or a site visit before that LOI on most of our deals. Um, we want to have that relationship dance a little bit and, um, Dusty's on the call. I see him listening. He's, he's, uh, he's got one of the best calibrated BS, BS detectors in the business. And he does a lot of the initial buyer screenings. And I think what he would say is like, don't BS us out of the gate. And so if you're the person that doesn't have the big brokerage account to show that you've got it in liquid cash, but don't don't come in and act like you do. And don't. So if you're in that situation, you were talking about, Kevin, where you're going to have to raise equity, um, introduce us to your kind of lead investor. Uh, show us that you're serious and aren't going to play games here with trying to lock up our deal. Like I was saying for an extended period of time while you go try to fundraise, because that just, I mean, when we get in that situation, our necks are on the line um, where uh, we don't know you, we don't know if your ability to fundraise is going to come through for us, but the clock's ticking and the seller, uh, like if you, if you don't come through, it's our next on the line and our reputation is on the line with our clients and the sellers. And so uh, we just want to know kind of out of the gate. And I'm one of the few because I've been so a lot of it's because I've been in so, so involved with the SMB Twitter community and see how active the fundraising scene is that I do believe if, if you're the right earnest buyer, that's got the right skills and resume and knows what you're doing and the seller's going to like you and I like you and you're, compliant, you're following the rules, you're playing the game the way we want you to and, and easy to work with, then I do believe that you'll be able to get your equity. But we need to to figure that out quick and and get that in place. But I still think there's a a big crop of brokers out there that view the search community with extreme skepticism and, and kind of view the the typical MBA searcher as as a dreamer without the the funds and ability to, to close deals and that we've got to uh, educate them. But then that community also has to step up their game and, um, you know, proving that they're, they're committed to the process and that they're going to be closers. And so I think we've all got to work together here. I I hear way too many um, LOIs going out from searchers that don't close 
And I think that we've got to get our ducks in a row better. Like you've got to as the buyer, and then we've got to vet you as the brokers to make sure you've got your ducks in a row and are ready to ready and serious and able to close the deal. Um, even if you're not independently wealthy, where you can just stroke a check and get it done. Clint, you, you teed up my next question perfectly. You mentioned searchers being viewed as quote unquote dreamers by much of the um, brokerage community. And I always kind of flippantly joke about searchers being viewed as, I call them diet private equity, right? Because they all look exactly the same. You know, you go to the websites, they're all, they've got a beautiful mountainscape with like a pond and some seagulls. <laughs> and it's like, you know, and, and you, and, and, really, I think, trying quite hard to look like private equity. And I always kind of wonder aloud if, if that's the best approach to get brokers to take you seriously versus saying, hey, I'm just a guy that's trying to buy a business, right? I'm not a searcher. I'm just a guy buying a business, you know, tales old as time. Tell us what your perspective is on searcher branding and what is the best way to present yourself you know, before that relationship is established, you know, if somebody sends you an inquiry, you Google their name, obviously, like everybody does for everything to figure out who the person is. What are the best things that could conceivably come up in that Google search to help the searcher be taken seriously? Yeah, I, I think I, I think it's not good to try to look like private equity when you don't have that history. Um, I would I would rather see you just be honest and say, I'm a, I'm a guy trying to buy a business. I'm a gal trying to buy a business. And here's a little bit about my background and here's why I'm serious. And here's how I've kind of got my everything. I've got my capital um, piece figured out. I've got the right experience and I'm, I'm ready to, to move quickly and, and get one done. That sounds better to me than when we look at your website of, of, you know, rolling oak capital or whatever it is. And, and you don't have a portfolio, you don't have any history. Like that's, that's where the rubber meets the road. If you're real private equity, you know, you, you've got a bunch of logos on there. You've got a bunch of other companies you, you've bought, you've got references and a track record. And if you're a searcher, uh, you don't. And, um, and so I would rather you just, you know, we sell businesses to individuals all the time and, just just be that and that's fine but definitely like don't don't throw off the bs flags trying to pretend you're private equity when you're not yeah you know i think uh i want to switch gears for just a second because there was a recent conversation on smb twitter that was a little controversial about personal guarantees and there was one story in particular, Clint, that kind of rubbed you the wrong way of a searcher who, you know, late in the game became, um, you know, aware of the personal guarantee and decided to walk away from the deal. And I had a conversation with um, with with Dusty about this, and I said, rather naively, that what's the big deal? You know, you guys can easily take that business back to market, but for a buyer, you know, it's um, uh, you know, it's 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 their whole life and personal guarantee and yada yada. They don't feel comfortable; they shouldn't have to close. And Dusty and I don't want to put words in his mouth down the call if he wants to chime in. Educated me on the fact that once that trust is gone with the seller, if something like that happens, that entire business sale may not occur. So I am curious your guys' thoughts, maybe on that situation specifically, but just kind of talking about your perspective on the relationship that you guys have with. The sellers and what you see in dealing with the sellers because we know what we see in dealing with sellers and you know oftentimes very challenging to get documents and due diligence and very challenging to get them to um to to agree on things and so tell tell us what that's like and how we can better approach sellers given that there is typically a demographical divide between the buyers and the sellers right now yeah what what really rubbed me the wrong way about that particular situation was this guy knew absolutely about the personal guarantee from the beginning. Like he was, he was better than that. You know, like it, I feel like he was fully educated and knew exactly what he was getting into, but then way late in the game decided he didn't actually have the stomach for it and, and bowed out. And I, I respect that he was very honest about that, but it, it's 
absolutely brutal. It's absolutely devastating to the broker. It's absolutely dev- it's devastating to the seller. And sometimes we only get one shot at it and, and they could really ruin, like you can ruin people's lives if you um, get them deep in a deal and then walk and leave them at the altar. And sellers can do. It. I mean, I was I was sharing a story this weekend about uh, sellers do that to buyers, and buyers can do that to sellers, um, and so it can go both ways. But we need to be able to trust each other here, and um, and so I don't know where I was going with that, Eric. What was the question? <laughs> well, the the question was how we can approach sellers more intelligently, given that there's demographic yeah. divides. You know, maintain. You know, you earning their trust, us earning their trust, like. What are some best practices there? Yeah, so just just keep a keep a good communication going. Like I get really scared when it gets quiet. So um, this is a collaborative effort. Where I where I like to do this is once the LOI a detailed LOI is in place, we're no longer negoti- We're no longer negotiating. We're now working together as a team, buyer, seller, broker attorneys, hopefully, you know, like we're all working together towards a common goal at that point. We're not trying to uh, constantly retrade and move the deal around once, once we've got the LOI. Um, Dusty just helped me close a deal last week, one that we were talking about that it was October under LOI and May closing. It was a absolute marathon. We, it took three banks um, to finally get one to do it. And the last one that did it was horrendous, but we, we did finally close it. And the role of the broker there is I a hundred percent believe if me and Dusty weren't involved with the seller, there's zero chance those buyers, uh, would own the two businesses. They just bought the roll up buyers that we talked about that bought the plumbing and HVAC. HVAC companies, they were searchers, uh, MBA searchers. Their first two acquisitions were for our firm. And we had to kind of go to the well so many times, talk the seller off the ledge. And, uh, you know, the the bankers were uh, saying one thing and the buyers were relaying what the banker would say. And then the bankers were straight up missing deadlines, lying to us and blowing it. And it makes the buyers look bad. Because they were they were really you know moving in good faith, but they just had bad banks, and um, and so we had to kind of get that deal on track. I don't I don't think if we were there, being that third party validation to tell the seller, look, Mister Seller, we talk. These buyers are still talking to us every day. They're texting us. They're calling us. They're not dodging our calls. I see the effort that they're making. I believe they're acting in good faith. I believe the problem is the bank and not the buyers. And we're able to kind of vouch for you and stick our neck. Like we're able to uh, speak for your behalf as the buyer. And so this is what's what people don't understand about business brokers like me and Ed is when we're doing our job, half the time, by the end of the deal, the seller starts saying things like, are you working for me or are you working for this buyer? Like I've, I've had that happen a lot. And I'm like, look, man, like I'm working for you. You're the one that hired me, Mr. Seller, but this buyer is having major issues with their banks, with their capital raise, but they're working hard. They're a good person. I believe like there's still a good chance that they can get this done. So just hang in there. Let's give it another few weeks. And whereas if they didn't have that experience, steady hands to kind of hold that together, it's just like, relational equity constantly being tapped to keep the seller from you know talking them off the ledge over and over and over again and when a real issue does arise um we find a compromise we say hey we've seen this problem before here's a way we think we could solve it solve it but you're just constantly triangulating dipping into that relational equity solving problems and kind of keeping the deal back on track when it tries to derail. And I don't know how people that don't have that that buffer, or that third party helping them, that don't have a lot of deal reps, kind of, I, I understand why so many deals fall apart is because you don't have somebody in there uh, just being the advocate for the deal that knows how to, you know, unstick those problems because every deal tries to die multiple times. And if you don't have, if you're just a buyer without an intermediary, 
um, the second, third or fourth time the thing gets off the track, the seller is going to start being like, man, you're just, you just don't know what you're doing and we're not going to sell to you buy, you know, and it's, it's not going to close. But if we're in there, you know, greasing the wheels and, and helping get that done, then, you know, by the end of the deal, we're usually best friends with the buyers and, and they'll come to us years later when they want to sell. And, and that's, that's what we go for is we we're truly functioning as intermediaries, unlike real estate where it's kind of one side versus the other side. Uh, we're, we're kind of in the middle hearing both sides out. And so one of the best ways to work with brokers is to get them to be your advocate to the seller, make friends with them, communicate, over communicate with them and earn that trust level because they'll go to bat for you and they'll save your deal multiple times before the end. Yeah, and I, I think it'd be helpful to hear your perspective on this as well. Um, maybe just to wrap up here yeah. and then we'll, we'll see if we have a few questions because I, I think it's a great, um, a, a great point, right? Um, and it's common and easy for buyers to look at brokers as sort of an advocate for the other side that's, you know, kind of a, a gatekeeper and, and really an obstacle, I, I think was the word uh, Clint used. Right, an obstacle to, to find their way around to the seller. Like, what, you pick up on that from your perspective, and, and talk us through the best way that that buyers can be working with um, the sellers, uh, you know, in a collaborative manner to get to get a, gil- a deal done. Yeah. So first things first is that you know I, I I tell we preface to all of our clients that you know if if the deal doesn't fall apart at least two times before we get to closing, we haven't earned our fee. And, and it, and it really, it tends to be true that, you know, everybody's pushing, you know, they, they're coming from different angles and different motivations and it's an emotionally charged event, life event. And so we, we bump into that a lot. And so how do buyers work with brokers to facilitate, you know, to, to help, um, to help that along. I mean, the first thing is organization. I mean, I've seen, you know, like Chris Mon has that has checklists that he, that he offers and, you know, being able to, as a buyer say, you know, here's my roadmap to getting this deal done. Okay. How am I, how am I going to get from, you know, you've given me the SIM. I kn- I have a hundred questions for you. I'm going to talk to you, talk to you about them. I'm, and then I'm going to give you this indication of interest. All right. And from there, we're going to then systematically figure out whether or not this deal works for us. And and I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I'm not going to spend months on it. I'm going to spend days on it. And I don't want to waste your time. But here here are the you know the 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 deal killers for us. And that sim, as as great as it's been prepared, it's it just doesn't tell us everything. But it tells us enough, and let's let's now have this conversation. We'll jump on Zoom or any other platform to have that conversation, and then so now the 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 seller now has the is beginning to to feel how the buyer is looking at their business because this is remember as, as an appraiser or a broker, I'm sitting here poking holes and saying, you know, this is where the buyer is going to start poking holes in, in this beautiful baby of yours. And then once we start moving into real live fire with buyers, you really start to see that, you know, here's the chinks in the armor. And so, so the seller, the seller now starts understanding the, you know, perhaps the value penalty that the buyer is going to give to the seller because of the shortcomings of the business. But to, to, to tie it up, I mean, the biggest thing is, Regardless of your access to capital, regardless of who you are, when you when you come to buy a business, it's it's a different animal. It's just it just is. And so when you come prepared with um, understanding that, you know, you're probably dealing with a first time seller and they're is scared to sell the business. And if you're a first time buyer, you're they're probably probably you're probably equally as scared to buy the business. And no one wants to make a mistake, but but just flippantly going about it on both sides is is the recipe for dis- disaster. So, as spending time with the seller, 
where they understand your motivation of why you're getting into business, who, you know, who's going to run the business, why you're looking at them, wh- what you plan to do with the business. All those things are, are factors, are intangible factors that will take, will, will likely take your deal further than just saying, you know, here, I'm going to offer you, you know, $5 million and, and, you know, we've got a $2 million earn out. And I need you to a, a five year non compete. You know that that just that doesn't that doesn't resonate tends not to resonate with the seller, especially these days. Is that that answer okay for you? I think you nailed it. And I'll and I'll just make this joke at the end. If the buyer's scared, that's normal. If the seller's scared, perfectly normal. If your lawyer is scared, you probably <laughs> you probably need a new lawyer. Uh, <laughs> But um, so, guys, we've got about 11 minutes left in the hour. Um, let's open the floor up if anybody has any specific questions or if there's any brokers or anybody in the audience that feels like they've got something of value to add. Please feel free to uh, to, to ping us to add you as a speaker. Um, and I think Clint said he was going to he was going to sing us a song while we wait for speakers to step up here. Is that right, Clint? What were you going to sing us? I mean, you call it, man. Whatever. <laughs> uh, man, how about, how about some Bon Jovi? Go ahead, Clint. That's all good. Yeah, we've got we've got a request here. You were you're spared. <laughs> um, all right, let's add Selecto SV. You're you're connecting. Feel free to um, ask your questions. You can connect there. Hi, right, can you hear me? Yep, we got you. Hello. Yep, we, we got you. We Excellent. Can hear you. So I, I'm curious uh, what kind of trends you guys are seeing in the market, given one, you know, the renormalization of interest rates. Um, how does that affect prices? How does that affect your financing lenders? Um, as well as, you know, I've seen an explosion of these kind of searcher accounts on Twitter, and it, and it seems like... Um, there, there's a huge, huge upswelling in this concept of kind of buying a business. Um, and so, you know, I'd, I'd be curious how you're seeing those two trends intersect and what that's doing to deal economics. I haven't seen much change, um, to be honest. Like in, in the levels that I play, I think Ed's a little bit more upmarket of me, but I'm most of our deals are seven figure deals that are, you know, two to four X EBITDA or SDE. And the the interest rate hikes just don't sink the model. And there's a swelling of interest. I'd say buyers are getting more and more and more abundant and more and more competitive. And I think that's kind of counteracting the small, smallish impact on interest rates on our deals. I feel like commercial real estate is much more interest, interest rate sensitive than small business deals. Uh, and so for me, um, deals are getting done. There's no shortage, shortage of interest in buyers. There's no shortage of bankers willing to do deals. And um, we're just, if anything, like down payments might be increasing a bit just because um, people are getting a little bit shy at times about max, max leverage at these current interest rates. But um, values haven't been as impact as, as I think the middle market has. Yeah. And to, to add to that, um, so I don't know, about a month ago, I spoke with, um, uh, at an event with live Oak and, and Lisa, you may have the, you may have the, uh, the slide deck that John Randall used. He's the sales manager, the national sales manager. And at any rate, the, the long and the short of it was that the borrowing power is down by about 20%. And naturally, you know, you, you have to assume that, you know, when the markets go down, there's going to be, eventually it's going to trickle into, into our world, which isn't necessarily a, you know, it, 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 it is what it is. Um, the cost of capital is what it is. The pro the problem that I see happening is that the sellers are anchoring to 21 and early 22 valuations mm-hmm. because because that's where the market data is coming yeah. from. And, <clears throat> you know, so, so for me, I don't, I don't see it as a, I haven't seen activity 
change. What I have seen is like, uh, you, you know, assuming the idle loan as a lower cost of capital. I've seen some, some buyers trying to do that. So, I mean, you got three and a half, 30 year money. You know, that's not a bad, bad way to, you know, bridge the gap on some of these, fun, some of this financing. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, I, I think what, where I'm heading with it is we're not seeing, you know, we're not seeing a slowdown. In fact, we're probably seeing a little bit more of a pickup. Um, multiples, multiples remain fairly constant. The earnings, are are trending a little bit down but you know generally speaking the bar so the 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 borrowing capacity coupled with the earnings margins being a little off is what's leading to the the lower the lower valuation at least from what i'm seeing yeah from, from the buyer's perspective from you know kevin feel free to you know have your own unique perspective on this but you know and it may be unique to s and Logger, but we've been very busy. And we have, we'll have we see transactions too where a high-quality business will go for sale. We'll have two or three buyers reach out to us to try to engage us to represent them to acquire that one business. Um, so it's it's really busy, really hot. And to Ed's point, you know these deals are now requiring more equity. Um, they just are because they're not penciling out the same way they were when interest rates were at 6%. They're now... You know, if you're now assuming north of 10% in your model, but what's interesting is the deals are getting funded and they're being, a lot of them, the good ones are being oversubscribed. I mean, the, the buyers that I've worked with several buyers in the last few weeks that are having kind of their pick of the litter of investors and having to make tough decisions about who's going to be on the cap table. So there's tons of people trying to come into the space to, to inject, inject equity into small business, given the issues in real estate and crypto and venture capital, and wherever else we're getting calls for pe people all the time saying, how do I deploy capital to this space? It, it may be unique to us. It'd be interesting to know if Ray or Lisa or, you know, the other people on the call have a different perspective um, or seeing some sort of, uh, of slowdown, but I, I haven't spoken to anybody who is, is, is seeing that. Um, okay. So we have five minutes left in the hour. If we have any, Additional questions, happy to field those if anybody wants to chime in now to speak. Otherwise, we can wrap up unless Clint or Ed or Kevin have any last words here. Uh, it, it, I'll pontificate while you guys are ho hoping for another question. That's have, all right. Have at it. Let's do it. Let's do it so a, a couple places that I think searchers should start to consider spending some time is in the ESOP communities. We've seen a, an influx of ESOPs that are being reversed out that, you know, a couple of years ago, it made, you know, somebody tried to jam an ESOP into, into a situation that probably wasn't a good candidate for an ESOP. And now they're, un, they're beginning to unwind. And the, the folks that I've talked across the country, you know, those are some it, it, Ed, really quickly, just for context for the listeners. Yeah. ESOP is an employee stock ownership plan where a company will sell to its employees tax free. So what Ed is suggesting is that companies were bought out. I think he's suggesting is companies were bought out by their employees, and now those employees are realizing that wasn't a good decision. We'd like yep. to sell. Is that, is that correct? Correct. Yes. Please get to So, that. so we, I mean, we've got three on the boards right now, and and I suspect that there are a lot more just like them because it it. It really made, you know, everybody was, you know, it, capital was, was cheap and a lot of owners were looking at, you know, that is their exit vehicle. Every, every business owner, I shouldn't say every, but many business owners that we talk to, ESOP is the, is their first option. Well, it doesn't work that way. And so my point is, as you're, as you're looking for, for sources of deals, I wouldn't exclude them on on your short list or talking to the ESOP the ESOP appraisal firms in the community. You know, those are to me those are some really good fertile ground. Um, anyway, so just just uh, just a thought on on where you might be missing some opportunity. Yeah, no, that's super great information, Ed. Um, we got just a, a couple minutes left, Andrew, from 
uh, Search Fund Coalition. For those that don't know, Andrew Hoffman requested to speak. Andrew, go ahead uh, if you have a question, and we'll we'll wrap up with your question. Uh, great, thanks, uh, Kevin and Eric, uh, for putting this together. Hi, Clint. Hi, Ed. Uh, uh, thanks for lending your uh, expertise to us uh, in the in the community. So, as Eric and Kevin mentioned, I run the Search Fund Coalition. We also look to help uh, first time acquirers level up and uh, find success within their acquisitions. So, one of the things that I was really curious about, uh, as this is a buyer's master's class, is um, you know kind of the de- the dance that needs to be done from the buyer's perspective with incomplete information, uh, submitting an IOI, and then a lot of the things that come up in terms of the buyers uncovering stuff uh, during during diligence. Um, so if you're supposed to be submitting an IOI uh, and then uh, you don't feel comfortable with that as being part of your process right away, like how do you, how, how do you navigate that, right, as a, as a buyer uh, and communicate that? Is it just part of the process that, that, that you need to be able to look to do? Uh, or, or is there something in particular uh, that that you would like to, or you think the audience should know? Oh, I could I could jump on that real quick. Uh, you know, I I think the IOI and submit the brokers that put a lot of pressure to to send an IOI immediately are concentrated more in the middle market, uh, in in the kind of premium Main Street, very lower rental market where I play, we typically don't do IOIs, we typically do LOIs. And we typically do that after you meet the seller. And it is more relationship driven and um, less of a auction, you know, type of vibe. And so what I would say is get move quickly, read the thim, read the sim thoroughly, get to the seller as quickly as you can with the broker, establish that rapport as quickly as possible. And the LOI is basically the handshake of all the major points of the deal that says, if everything is as you've said and presented, then this is the price and terms that I would like to close this deal on. And then as quickly as possible behind that, think of the, before you just drop like a 60 point diligence request, Think of like the three things that you're most worried about that if you figure out like what are the the real deal breakers you're concerned about that you don't know real clear answers on yet. Try to get them in front of the LOI if you can. But if you can't, just dig into those real quick and try to like get if there's a fight that needs to be had or uh, just try to get it as quickly as possible identified as to what the issues are. And then solve those and then use the remainder of your due diligence time um, on the, the finer points that aren't the, the ones you're most concerned about as deal breakers. So you enter into it in good faith saying, based on everything you said, I've asked all the big questions. This is, this is the terms of the deal that I'm comfortable with. And then you just got, think of your deal breakers, do that first, and then do the big list right behind the the potential deal breakers you're most concerned about and, and get after it. And, and I would, I would add that, you know, it's incumbent upon the broker and who's representing that seller to coach that seller. And, and I know Clint does it. And I know everybody that is doing lots of deals does it. And it's, you know what, we're going to, we're going to take this, we're going to get real buyers and they're going to have real questions. And if you're, if you're BSing them, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's, we're gonna find out. So if your financial statements are misstated, if the cash flow is off and, and, you know, this $50,000 credit card expense, if it's bullshit, it's not gonna work. And I'm just telling you right now, let's cover this before we take it to market because nothing, nothing is worse than losing the buyer confidence when you when you start dealing with them. So I think to me, it's <clears throat> that's as much the broker's fault as it is the seller's fault that they're not coached on, you know, you got it, you got to know what, what you're dealing with. And, and that there's a real possibility of retrading as a result of, you know, whether it's a mistake or not, if the, if it isn't what you say it is, it, it's likely going to be retraded. So that those are the you know, that's what you're faced with. So 
understand that when you're going to the market. And at any rate, I think, um, yeah, I, I think that's probably a, a you know part part responsibility on the broker, but certainly the the seller needs to understand. <laughs> you know, there's there's reliance on what they, you know, what they're putting out there. So, yeah, uh, super helpful, guys. Really, really appreciate the input. Thanks for the couple of questions. Um, we're up against the hour. Uh, I think we'll wrap up there, Eric. Any uh, any final parting words? No, just I, w- I want to thank Ed and, and and Clint for doing this, and just uh, again a plug for the the business buying masterclass. There's a link in the comments. Um, if you haven't already, go read. And you're interested in this topic, go read issue four, which covers this in depth, and it is uh, written by Clint and Ed respectively, uh, and they're. You know, they're they're uh, they're brilliant based on their experience in this this sector and really appreciate them taking the time to do this. And I really feel like everybody who has read this, even myself, will be a better business buyer for it. So thank you, Ed. Thank you, Clint. Thank you, Kevin, for uh, for getting out tonight and um, look forward to, to the next one. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank you for joining us today on the How to Sell Your Business podcast. If you want more episodes packed with strategies to help sell your business for the maximum value, visit howtosellabusinesspodcast.com for tips and best practices to make your exit life-changing. Better yet, subscribe now so you never miss future episodes. This program is copyrighted by MISO Inc. All rights reserved.